Nee. It's mine. Um, okay, hello. Uh, I think everyone, I guess, everyone is ready uh, for some after lunch nap, right? <laughs> uh, but hopefully not. Uh, so, hello everyone, I'm, my name is Bartek and I work for, com for, for the company called Improbable. And this is Fabian, um, who worked with us uh, for a short time between his uh, role at the, as a tech lead in CoreOS and, and the current role at Google. And we are really, really uh, excited to introduce you to the Thanos, our open source project that we started in the, by the end of the last year. Uh, we address this talk to those who are not yet familiar with the Thanos, but also for those that maybe have seen our blog post, improbable blog post about Thanos, maybe experimented a little bit with Thanos already, or even deployed that on their environments. Uh, so by the end of this talk, I would like you to know what Thanos is, what uh, problem it solves, and how to use it and how to deploy it. So next 20 minutes, we look as follows. First, we will talk uh, what problems are to be, it's worth to consider when running Prometheus at scale. Secondly, we'll cover how Protanos uh, helps in those areas. And by the end, we will uh, talk shortly about uh, example deployment models. So yeah, I need a clicker. Yep. So everything starts with the single Prometheus server. And I think it is safe to say that uh, single Prometheus server is extremely powerful. Uh, it has re reliable, it, was, it has proven to be reliable. It has flexible query language and it is capable to scrape five million series, uh, time series at the same time without using too many resources, so it's great. Uh, and the Prometheus 2 is even more improved, thanks to the hard work of the Prometheus community. Uh, for example, retention can be a lot longer, uh, even with just the local storage. But how all of those uh, things, uh, features fit together when we are talking about scale? And in fact, when we, talk, when, we, when we are talking about the scale that is out of the scope for the single Prometheus server, we are not necessarily talking about the performance limits. Uh, usual, the usual reason why people scale out Prometheus servers are because the service that you want to monitor, so monitor ta monitoring targets, are grouped within multiple of isolated clusters in, or data centers uh, that are spread across the world uh, within different ge geographical uh, regions. Uh, and if the recommended way to run Prometheus is within the same failure domain, so the same network, the same region, uh, we have no other choice than actually running uh, one or more Prometheus server in each cluster. So let's maybe focus on, on the issues we can spot while using this approach. So first, first issue is quite obvious, so how to use this, all of this data from the single place. Usually you have a separate cluster um, that holds your dashboard engine, your alert managers, and you basically connect uh, this cluster to all of the scrapers. So that usually works, but it's kind of limited because you, when you want to do a query that aggregates the data from the various cluster, well, you cannot easily do that um, right now. So, so the query that aggregates you know, all environments on all clusters. And one could say that, well, it is relatively easy to solve uh, using Prometheus uh, Hierarchy Health Federation, right? Uh, so you basically spin up another global Prometheus that scrapes all the leaf Prometheuses and exposes, uh, yeah, enables that query. But yeah, it has its limits. First of all, there is a double scrape there. So it's yet another place to care for missed scrapes. Uh, but more importantly, usually you are not uh, able to, to, to fit all of the data from the leaves Prometheuses in your federated one. That means uh, that you, need, you are forced to use pre-prepared uh, recording rules uh, and actually expose only of those. So it's not easy and, and, and uh, kind of might, might be problematic in some cases. And the whole problem we are talking about, we can call a global view problem. Next one uh, is how to maintain the high availability for your monitoring data 100% uh, time. Uh, it's not strictly related to scalability, but it is uh, essential for, for example, for us, for Improbable, because we care about every minute, every sample uh, of the monitoring data, so it's kind of essential. And the usual way to do it is to basically 
add yet another replica of the Prometheus server to your cluster in each cluster. So you have multiple replicas that scrape the same targets. And well, you have an HA, but how to use this data again? So we have yet another Prometheus server to support for global view problem, uh, with the exception that this data is special, duplicated, and there is no native handling of those on uh, natively on Grafana or Prom UA. Uh, the last problem, I think, is the major trouble for the typical Prometheus user. So basically, how to uh, make available all the data uh, that, that is super, super old, and we are talking about a month worth of the data or, or even a couple of years. And this screenshot uh, actually shows the um, screenshot uh, from Thanos query, so the memory consumption for five months. So it's kind of perfect, but it's not always like that. Without Thanos, uh, you are, I mean, usually pretty limited, uh, and sometimes in the worst cases, to few days. So how to enable long retention without tunnels? Uh, well, I think there are like two major options. First, you uh, basically deploy Prometheus with huge SSD disk, or the, you, you can use remote write feature with some uh, hosted or on-premise uh, solution available on the market. Uh, but both of these options are not perfect. Uh, the, the former one, the, the, the huge disk, uh, basically has some cost and manageability issues, and I'm talking about uh, operations like resize, like backup. Uh, the latter one, the remote uh, write feature, is, uh, is not perfect as well because of the very delicate and complicated path for sending, for pushing basically gigabytes of sample on the fly. So it's, it's not easy to implement. And that's why we created Thanos. Uh, basically, that were the three reasons we, 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 we had in our mind uh, while creating that, while, while, start, while starting that uh, at the November 2017. So let's take a closer look how Thanos solves those. And we start with the global view, so the ability to see uh, all the data from the very single place. Everything starts, again, with the Prometheus, vanilla Prometheus uh, that is uh, running somewhere with some local storage and scraping some targets. To enable Thanos, you basically want to uh, deploy another uh, binary called Thanos sidecar next to the Prometheus binary. Uh, so, for example, within the, say, pod, if you are running on Kubernetes. And by default, this sidecar exposes a gRPC API called store API that allows to fetch a local data from Prometheus. And in fact, the same store API is implemented, uh, the same interface is used on every Thanos component, so it's, so it's the same everywhere. Uh, and, but uh, in terms of like sidecar implementation, it's relatively easy, relatively simple. It is a simple proxy that fetches compressed uh, series, series uh, matched by label measures. And uh, why this is helpful? So basically, we can now add yet another Thanos component called Thanos Querier that uh, understands the store API and is able to fetch the data uh, from the local Prometheus and actually evalu evaluate the query on the Thanos Querier level. And what is really nice about it, it exposes the same query API, HTTP query API, as Prometheus does. So if you're using any like, external system that you integrate with the Prometheus, the move from the, Thanos, uh, from the Prometheus to Thanos it should be seamless. And thanks to the fact that the Thanos query is a separate component to the Thanos sidecar, we can actually point to multiple of sidecars and access the data from the very single place. Uh, so, it's pretty, so basically that allows us to have a unified global view. Uh, but additionally to that, uh, Quair also implements the duplication logic, which uh, allows you to point to the multiple uh, replicas of Prometheus, Prometheus that scrapes the same targets, and you can distinguish those by a special label that you configure. It could be replica, like in our case, and uh, you configure that label on the Thanos Quair side, and Query then is able to deduplicate uh, the, the data based on that label, and it trims that uh, special label uh, from the exposed results. As an effect, from the two, uh, let's say, duplicated series, we have one, so the HA is totally uh, transparent for a user, so it's cool. Um, 
And yeah, in fact, um, Thanos sidecar and Thanos query are just enough, these two components are just enough to fulfill two first goals. So the global view and availability. And in fact, you can stop right now if that satisfies your requirements and uh, you just want this, all these two goals. You can just grab a ton of square, uh, point to the multiple scrapers, and uh, maybe <laughs> specify which prompt to use is in, in which uh, HA group. And you can use square from there. Yeah, you can use, uh, you can have a global view and actually access everything from the single place. Uh, so now I'm going to pass the microphone to Fabian, who will talk uh, more about more advanced features and capabilities of Thanos. Thanks. All right. So um, the third goal we had was historical data. So we would like to have basically infinite retention. And before we look into that, we look back at um, Prometheus's local TSDB storage format. Um, and what Prometheus does is it accumulates data in memory for about two hours, and every two hours it dumps all current memory data onto disk in a single compact block in a very compressed form. And inside of these blocks are a few larger files that contain compressed series data. Um, so these can be multiple files, but they're in size about like 200, 300 megabytes, I think. Um, and they are paired with one index file. And the index file actually knows what, where, which samples are where and how to find them. So the index file is required to basically resolve your query and then find, find the right data points. And um, as we accumulate more of these two-hour blocks, uh, we at some point compact them together, which means we can improve the compression efficiency even more. And also, we basically don't have to do as many index lookups for a query that spans a longer time range. So that's how Prometheus works locally today. And we're actually going to use this. Um, so the first step to actually doing long-term storage is getting the data to a place where we can actually store them in a scalable way. Um, we basically don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and we found that one option is quite convenient, and that is object storage, because it's available everywhere, um, no matter which cloud you're in or which sort of reasonably sized uh, on-prem installation you're in, there's always going to be some kind of object storage. Um, and they're usually really, really cheap um, and really durable. Um, just kind of slow. Um, so what we now make the sidecar do is we watch the data directory of Prometheus, and whenever we see a new block appear, we just upload it to our object storage bucket. And that's pretty cheap and pretty simple. And the good thing is that Prometheus basically keeps these blocks around for longer, so even if we had to have some intermittent failure between our object storage and the Prometheus server, um, and we are, have no connectivity for like five hours, after these five hours, we just come back and we can just upload these blocks. Um, and since they are fairly well compressed, it's not going to sort of consume all our um, network link. We only have to make two really small changes. Um, we have to basically disable the local compaction in Prometheus so that the sidecar uploading the blocks and Prometheus trying to compact them don't interfere with each other. And in return, we just make the retention much shorter because our long-term data now is going to be in the object storage. And we just don't need more than 12 to 48 hours on Prometheus, except for this sort of safety margin, so we don't lose data if there's some temporary failure. That's fairly easy. Um, but now we have to query it. And as I said, object storage is kind of slow, um, especially because these files in our blocks are pretty large. Um, one option would be, OK, whenever the query uh, gets a query, we just download all blocks that kind of match what we want to use, um, which would probably take a few minutes. Um, or even hours for, uh, for a big query. Um, so we don't do that. Um, instead, we have a store gateway component, um, which basically watches our object storage. And whenever a new blog appears, it sort of gets the really most basic metadata out of it. And sort of the only the smallest entry point into the index, so that it roughly knows where to start resolving um, the index and the query in the files. And what we then do is whenever we get a query, we look up in our cache which blocks would be applicable. And then we do range queries against the object storage. So we don't download entire files. We just download ranges of like a few kilobytes to a few megabytes with only the data we need. And this is actually really, really fast, uh, surprisingly. So we developed this against Google Cloud Storage initially. And I think the average latency for these requests is like 20 milliseconds. And that's, for practical purposes, for monitoring data, almost real time. So it's, in some cases, really hard to notice whether you're hitting Prometheus uh, directly or actually hitting object storage. Yeah, uh, that's basically it. <laughs> um, with, that, with that, we basically get infinite retention, right? Object storage is insanely cheap. Even if you accumulate like dozens of terabytes of data, we probably don't really care. Um, and if we don't care about 
some data anymore, we can easily delete it because these blocks are fairly well specified in terms of which time range they cover and from which Prometheus server they came from. So you can really just like write your own best script and then delete data you don't care about any longer. So to sort of summarize this, how we go from Prometheus to Thanos, um, the query and Prometheus, the query engine is basically replaced by the stateless and horizontally scalable query layer Thanos has, which is nice because now if you have sort of queries of death, uh, you're not going to wipe out your scraping logic anymore. You just take out one replica and everything else will probably mostly be fine. That's a really big benefit. Um, the scrape engine is essentially replaced by a bunch of Prometheus servers. Their main job today is really now to just scrape data and persist it locally at least until the sidecar uploaded it into the long-term storage and serve queries at least um, for, for some time range. Um, yeah, and you still want to keep most of your recording rules and alerts on the local Prometheus servers just because you don't want to introduce another few hops in between. Um, and you can basically serve these alerts and recording rules from memory in Prometheus, which is also sort of more fault tolerant. Um, but in some cases, you might want to have alerts across your entire fleet, across all your data centers. And for that, the Thanos ruler component is quite nice because it can actually hit the query and then evaluate against the global state. Um, and since we disabled compaction on Prometheus, we have to do it somewhere if we want to get the same sort of query efficiencies, efficiencies out of it. And that's why we have this fairly simple singleton um, batch job, which essentially just looks at your bucket, looks at your bucket, um, and yeah, then just downloads blocks, compacts them together locally, and re-uploads them and deletes the old ones. So that's fairly simple, though. That's sort of the most complex component, probably. Uh, yeah. And additionally, of course, we have the object storage with all our data, and the store gateway now gives us easy access. And from the courier perspective, the Thanos ruler, the sidecar, the store gateway, they all are the same. They just provide us of data. And the courier then can sort of smartly figure out which of these it actually has to hit uh, for certain queries based on the label matches or time ranges. Um, yeah, so how do you deploy this? Uh, it's actually quite flexible. So from in general, the architecture is probably like this. You have a cluster, and you have a few Prometheus servers in there, and then you just add sidecar to it. And for each cluster, you have a query layer that knows how to talk to all these uh, Prometheus servers, and you will probably end up with like one bucket um, per cluster. And then, since queries also implement the store API, they can appear as just another data source to any other query, which is quite convenient because that's essentially federation. So if you have some sort of master monitoring cluster where actually they actually hit to get all data, um, you can just set up this query to hit all other queries. But if you are sort of bigger and have a more complex and more customized uh, structure like Improbable, um, you might have something like this. You have a bunch of clusters and they all have one pair of Prometheus servers. And then you have another sort of master cluster that hosts all the other Thanos components and the queries. You can fan out to multiple clusters. And if you then go even further, like in their case, uh, you have multiple sort of layers of these or environments of these multiple clusters, and you can just add another layer on top um, <laughs> that you can then query to query all the other ones. Uh, yeah, so in general, you're really, really flexible. Um, and in theory, you could even just plug in your own data source um, because the query is just looking for other store APIs. Yeah, um, that's sort of the basic thing. Um, now a small bonus section on downsampling. Prometheus has really good compression, um, so a 16-byte sample ends up being just slightly over one byte of data, um, which is really good in terms of storage efficiency. That's why we don't really care about how much storage we use in our object storage. Um, but that comes with a cost, and that's, of course, computational. So decompressing one sample takes about 10 to 40 nanoseconds. And if you do this across like 1,000 time series at a 30-second scrub interval over one year, which seems like fairly reasonable now that we have all this Thanos stuff going on, um, that means it's like 10 to 40 seconds just to decompress the sample values. And that's sort of way overshadowing actually fetching the data and resolving the data. So that's really like your main, main time consumer. And then of course, if you query all these samples, the processing over those will also be more expensive. So downsampling doesn't really matter for us in terms of space um, or sort of network bandwidth we use, but just in terms of query processing. And that's why we decided to just add two basic levels of downsampling, which is a five minute um, resolution and a one hour resolution on top of your raw resolution. And that's basically done within the compactor, uh, which then on top of compacting also does downsampling. And it's a bit 
complicated, let's say, because we can't just sort of delete some samples in between, or we could, but that's not the best way to do it, I guess. Um, we're actually computing multiple time aggregates, okay? Uh, so that we can basically access different downsampled aggregates depending on the query we are getting. And that gives you overall better results. Uh, yeah, so we reached all our goals, everything's great. And we have hopefully time for questions or not? Yes. And we have a lot of GitHub stars. Okay, so questions. First him, then yes. Hi, thanks for a talk. Uh, I was wondering how the deduplication worked. So if you have two Prometheus uh, and you just show uh, like one time series, uh, how th yeah, if one has a gap and the other hasn't, how do you select? Uh, yeah, um, so basically what we do is we follow one time series as long as it is providing data within its usual um, resolution that we're measuring. And if we sort of notice that there are two skips in it or more, we just flip over to the other one if possible. That means that we don't sort of um, oscillate around if there's some data anomaly that could give you weird results. So we do sort of try to stick with one series and only flip over if there's a significant gap. Uh, can you give us a sense of the scale you've tried running Thanos at and what kind of latency characteristics you've seen. And my second question is like, what kind of cost should we expect from like running the object store? Yeah, uh, yeah um, so actually I don't have like actual numbers yet, but what I can uh, offer you is a benchmarking tool we wrote for Thanos, and we have some initial uh, numbers. I don't remember them, those nows, but I can I can point you. Basically, it is on the Thanos repository. Uh, ask a question on the Slack and uh, and or, or, or the issue, and I can point you to the initial kind of uh, results. So that's for the first question. For the last, uh, the cost for the um, object storage. I think we have a slide for that. Can we show? Maybe yeah. maybe it's easy. Okay, it's deep down somewhere. We have, we have a slide, but it's like nobody understood the example, so I will just try to do a different one. Uh, it's going to be cheaper in general. Um, the query processing is going to be the same cost, right? Just like moving it to a different process. Um, same for the scraping stuff that stays the same. What mostly changes is that you need less disk space, so you're saving SSDs, which can be quite expensive, especially in cloud. Um, and you replace this with object storage, which is much, much cheaper, so you should end up saving money overall. Um, how much downsampling is helping with that? Probably repeat real quick. We have a new mic. Yeah, so the question was how much downsampling actually helps your queries. Um, and as you've seen, we are basically downsampling from the average like 30 seconds to five minutes first and then to one hour. So if you zoom out, we basically get a lower resolution data. And if you zoom into your graph, you get higher resolution data. That happens automatically. Um, and if you sort of pick the lowest resolution, like one hour, that's about 120x less samples you have to process. So that means this particular step, which is the most expensive one, will improve significantly. So it can go easily from like 60 seconds to like two seconds or less. Hi, uh, for your name for your project, Thanos, I'm curious, uh, was it named after Marvel? We didn't quite think that's true, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for like long-term storage, it's a pretty bad idea too. <laughs> but we are downsampling, that kind of fits somehow. So just two points of order. A, the next speaker, please move up. And B, also defragment. And the people standing there, there's more seats in the middle and here. More questions? Uh, hey, great talk. 
Uh, so about Thanos Ruler, um, I know that it was in development. Uh, is it ready now? Sh can we use it or should we still use uh, Prometheus so, rules? Could you repeat the question? Sorry. About Thanos Ruler, the rules. Ruler, yeah. yeah. Can, um, is it ready? Can we use it? Uh, last time I checked, it was in development or something? Uh, no, it should be usable. It is kind of tested, but uh, yeah, just use it. I <laughs> Don't worry about um, it. Yeah. More questions? Yes. And for very large data sets, is it possible to specify retention periods? And specifically, is it possible to specify differently per resolution so that lower resolution data is kept for a longer time? Yeah, very good question. Uh, I think this is something you can still do relatively quickly uh, using some you know, script you write on your own. But there is definitely a super, super um, plenty of people who want this feature. So actually, we create, I think I created that last week. Uh, and kind of, uh, yeah, GitHub issue that, that states how we can do it. So yeah, this is totally possible and makes sense. It doesn't make sense for, for my case, definitely for my company, because it's kind of cheap, so, so we are not at this point that we care about the size, but for, for other purposes that from some object storage, uh, you have limited number of objects or something like that. I, I totally get that. So yeah, PR's welcome, but uh, if not, someday it will be implemented. I guess, but uh, we have some, uh, I want to also add that, uh, feel free to join our Slack community, the, the Slack, you have Slack link invitation in the Thanos repository. Uh, go, go there, ask questions, and, and basically you can help. Hi there, uh, excellent uh, project, I love it. I know it's just a number, but when do you think we can expect like a 1.0 version of it? Uh, I the think 0 .0 0.0.1 is a bit scary, at least for my managers, so yep. yeah, it is on. Yeah, it's kind of on purpose uh, because uh, yeah, we, we want to test it and, and may, can be. Um, we want to be perfectly sure that everything is stable and and the API is stable and we have all the features. We have a couple of actually two proposal that proposals that I will show uh, maybe afterwards when I have some time after the talks. Uh, so. Some features are still missing, so so before moving to the perfect one, perfect one, release one, right? Oh, uh, hi, thanks. Uh, uh, to, uh, one more question: How, uh, for example, when new features are well, something changed on storage level or layer on Prometheus, or fun new function is added? How 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 do you plan to come to keep upstream, or what is uh, basically would be the project which we can? After year, can can uh, can become obsolete. It's co community driven only, right? At the moment. Exactly. Um, so the main thing is that uh, I, so I can't imagine Prometheus. what what could. I mean, uh, it's hard to imagine what can happen, right? But uh, we we really are using the vanilla components from from the Prometheus itself. We we basically uh, we are depends on it. We use the same code for the query for the storage layer blocks, whatever. So when Prometheus changes, when TCDB changes, we are changing as well. Uh, so I think we'll be able to adapt pretty quickly, hopefully. Thank you very much.